I want to speak to you this morning about the beginning of birth pains. That's the phrase Jesus used. I want to know, are we in the beginning of birth pains, as Jesus used the phrase? And so we're going to examine the word today, and we're going to try to interpret or understand the times we're in. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 2, 16, 2, he said, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. He was telling his generation, the Jews of his day, look, you don't know how to look at the word and understand the times you're in. You don't know, understand, you, you can't interpret the signs of the times, meaning the signs of the times of his first advent. He's saying, you can't look at the word and understand who I am, why I'm here, what I'm doing, who you are, what's going to happen, what I'm supposed to do, what I'm going to do, how, you, how you're supposed to respond to that. And he holds his generation accountable for not knowing the word and not responding accordingly. And he's going to hold us accountable for not understanding the signs of the times that we're living in as well, according to the word of God and its uh, revelation of his second coming, the parousia of Christ. He's going to hold us accountable. If we're asleep and we're not in the word and we don't understand the days we're living in. So that's what this sermon is about. Understanding the signs of the times, being watchful, being awake, looking toward the second coming of Christ so that we are not caught off guard when he comes like a thief in the night. By the way, that doesn't mean that he's coming in a secret second coming or he's coming before the second coming in a secret, uh, in a secret way, in a hidden way. Every time he says, I'm coming like a thief in the night, what he means is, I'm coming in such a way that if you're not ready, it's going to catch you off guard. You're going to miss it. You're, going to, you're not going to be ready, and you're going to be cast out, is what he means. So, in Matthew 24, that's where we're going. We're going to Matthew 24, Mark 13. We're talking about the Olivet Discourse. Um, I'm just going to take Mark 13, Matthew 24, and just kind of just mesh them together. Hope you can hang in there with me. Um, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be, the destruction of the temple? That was in 70 AD. Jesus answered that very clearly. But then they asked, What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Notice, first of all, and I'm going to reiterate this again. If you're, in, if you're at Cornerstone, you should already know this. But both Jesus and Paul make it very clear. They're not a bunch of dispensations. That's man-made. That's John Darby stuff, uh, 1830. Jesus and Paul made it very clear. The Word of God makes it very clear that there are only two ages. There's the age of sin, this present evil age, the age of darkness, and there's a coming age of Messiah. Period. Two ages. We're living in the age of sin. And when the Bible talks about the end of the age, it's not talking about the end of the world. Jesus says, Lo, I'm with you till the end of the aeon, the age, the age of sin. I'm with you till the end of the age of the sin. Uh, and that age of sin will have a cutoff. And that cutoff point is called the day of the Lord when Jesus returns in glory and power, delivers his saints from persecution that they're under, and then issues the wrath of God on the world. We know that Jesus has overlapped them in a way of speaking when he came the first time, uh, but the age of sin will have a blunt terminus when Jesus returns. The Jews called that age the Messianic age. A lot of Christians refer to that as the millennial, the millennial reign of Christ, the millennium, all right, the thousand-year reign of Christ, that messianic age. Some will say don't interpret the thousand years literally. It just refers to a never-ending age of, of Christ's reign. Regardless, I'm not getting into that. What we're talking about are two ages. And so when the Bible says the end of the world, that's the King James Version. And that's a bad translation. There is no such thing as the end of the world. It may feel like the end of the world, but it's the end of the age of sin, this present evil age of darkness that gives way to the age to come, as Paul puts it and Jesus put it, at the sudden appearance of Jesus Christ, the King of the kingdom. In verse 37, And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. That's where he begins. Don't let people lead you astray. In other words, stay awake. That's where he's going to end as well. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. That has been ever since the beginning of the world. Bar Kokhba was a false messiah in the second century. There have been many false messiahs throughout uh, history. 
But John would say there are many antichrists in the world. And that may be what Jesus refer, is referring to. There are many antichrists. Don't be led astray. Throughout history, there are many antichrists. But that will increase as we get closer to the end of the age and the second coming of Jesus Christ. There will be much confusion in the church, in other words, and we see that today, absolutely. So what we're doing is we're looking at these signs, if you will, of these markers is a better way to put it. Of course, the disciples asked for the sign. The sign is not these. The sign will be the abomination of desolation. But these are markers moving us toward the abomination of desolation, the sign of his that he's coming. And um, these markers are the markers that we're in the beginning of birth pains. So let's look at the Word of God. Let's understand the signs of the times. And possibly we'll see that, yeah, I believe, or we believe, we, we, we're, it's possible we're in the beginning of birth pains here. All right? Number one, there'll be much confusion. People coming and saying, I am he. There'll be many faults false Christ. There'll be many antichrists in the world at that time. And then verse 7, and when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place. But the end of the age is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. When you begin to hear about wars and rumors of wars, so that's the event uh, that must take place. Number two, all right, in the 20th century, study the 20th century, the 1900s, and you'll find out that was the bloodiest time of all of, of all history. The, the bloodiest century was the 20th century. Um, we're now in the longest war we've ever been in in Afghanistan. There's a lot of saber rattling going on between the East and the West, Russia and China and the U.S. and North Korea and the U.S. Um, there's a lot of saber rattling in the Middle East right now. We're seeing Aragon, the, the president of, of Turkey, uh, he really coming into power, saber rattling with Greece right now, um, talking about the new caliphate uh, that's coming upon the world. There hasn't been a caliphate for 100 years. In 2023, it'll be 100 years since the world has had a caliphate. And uh, it, it looks like they want to institute a new Islamic caliphate in 2023, 2024. Uh, they're moving toward that. Amazing things are happening in the world. And then Jesus says there will be, number three, earthquakes in various places. Uh, if you study earthquakes, you're going to see that uh, there are more earthquakes uh, in the last decade, the last two decades, than there ever has been in the, in the history of the world, at least since we've been um, recording earthquakes. They've been increasing in frequency and intensity. Um, and, and you can look at the graphs. I may put one up uh, for you to look at and just see the frequency and intensity is increasing of earthquakes. It, it's a regular occurrence. We turn on the news and another earthquake in California, another earthquake. Hey, this week it was there was an earthquake in Turkey. I mean, that was I think it was yesterday or two days ago, an earthquake in Turkey. Constantly heard earthquakes all over the world in diverse places, many places of the world. We're hearing about that. And there will be number four famines. I don't know if you've noticed that in Africa, the locusts, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's increased famines in, in certain parts of Africa because of locusts. I don't know if you've noticed, but due to some COVID fallout consequences, uh, farmers are destroying crops in America, pouring hundreds, if not thousands of gallons of milk out and burying crops they can't sell. Uh, packaging plants and meat, meat processing plants are closing down. Uh, food prices are skyrocketing. Uh, just go try to buy a, a ribeye steak like I, I used to like to do. Um, now we just eat turkey and chicken. And then he says pestilences and plagues. That, that would include, uh, I believe, probably what we're seeing in 2020, the COVID pandemic. We've had the Spanish flu in the last 100 years. The Spanish flu, the swine flu, H1N1, 2009. Bird flu, Ebola, Zika, now covid um, pandemics, plagues, we're seeing those. I'm just saying we're seeing them. And that's what Jesus says. These are but. <laughs> These are but. These are just, just the beginning of birth pains. And what we're saying or what we're potentially seeing, according to Jesus' prophecy, the Olivet Discourse, which fleshes out Old Testament prophecy and interprets Revelation prophecy, the revelation of Jesus Christ, in the revelation that was given to John the Apostle, what we're seeing potentially is that we may be we have may have found ourselves at the beginning of birth pains. This doesn't surprise me. God gave me certain visions in 2010, 2016 
um, that woke me up to the times that we're in. Those are personal to me, but uh, 2020 was not a surprise to me. The, the way it occurred was a surprise, but um, God will wake up his children. God wants to wake us up, especially in the West. The church in the West has been asleep for too long, and God wants to wake us up. So these birth pains that Jesus referred to are not the end of the age, all right? They are the markers that the end of the age is near. The, 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 the abomination of desolation, when the Antichrist does that in the temple, that's the sign, man. It starts the, what's called, what Jesus calls the tribulation of the saints, and that is ended by his return, all right? What the birth pains are are, contra, are contractions, They're contractions that will result in the birth of the kingdom of God on earth. That kingdom is a mustard seed. It's been growing and growing and growing to become a a large tree. It's that rock that crashed into the Roman Empire some 2,000 years ago and is growing to become a large mountain. It's the leaven that was hidden into into the loaf and it's taking over the loaf. All right, so we know these things. I'm just making sure I'm not clipping here with my microphone. I'm being extra loud today. The birth pains are the contractions of earth that will lead to the birth of the kingdom on earth. And the end of the kingdom's gestation period begins with these contractions. It's the, it's, we're about to see the birth of the age of Messiah. You might call it the millennial reign. I don't care what you call it. It's the, it's the age of Messiah. We're about to see the birth of that if we are actually in these birth pains. We're close to to seeing the end of the age of sin and darkness and corruption. Have mercy. It's time for the church to wake up. These pains, according to Jesus Christ, are not localized. That's another, that's another key. They're not just localized, they're global. Earthquakes in diverse places. Wars and rumors of wars all over the world. Paul says in Romans 8, Creation waits for the eager longing with the, for the revelation of the sons of God. Verse 22, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Not only the creation, but we ourselves, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of the sons, adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. The earth is groaning for the redemption and the revelation of God's sons at the end of the age. And the birth pains will increase. So that's a marker. It's not as if we've never seen earthquakes in the world before, or false Christ before, or famines before. They've plagued the world since the beginning of time. I mean, before Christ, we had false Christs. Antiochus Epiphanes, for instance, or Antiochus Epiphanes, however you want to pronounce it, doesn't matter. But what he's saying is these birth pains, these things you've seen sporadically throughout history, these birth pains will increase in frequency and intensity the nearer you get to the end of the age. The end of the age of sin will become the greatest time of sin the world has ever known, just like the days of Noah. Sin will increase to the point where God has to come and render justice. He can't take it anymore. So Jesus is saying very clearly in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, 33, yeah, you've seen all of these things from time to time throughout history. But he says, when you see all these things, in other words, converging, intensity, frequency, when you see all of them together in the world, happening at the same time, you know that the end is near. Excuse me, you know that he is near, not the end. But you know he is near. That's the Son of God himself. You know he's near at the very gates. The other pains, the other markers, birth pains of the Olivet Discourse, if you continue reading, is persecution. The church is persecuted. Then the proclamation of the gospel to all nations. That's happening right now. By the way, not only was the 20th century the most bloody century of history, but uh, the 21st century is the most uh, persecuted hit century in history. The church, there's more bloodshed, uh, more Christian blood being shed than any other time in history. Then he has, says another marker is division, hatred between people, even in their own family. We're seeing that today, hatred on the street, hatred between people who can't agree politically, religiously, uh, ethnically. We're seeing that in our own streets. Our, our cities are in 
absolute turmoil and chaos and anarchy, many of them. Over division. So the point is taken very well. The actual delivery of the child called the kingdom of God will be very and utterly painful. I've had six children and know how it works. Sometimes in the middle of the night, your wife begins to have contractions. And they're sporadic, you know? But as she comes closer to delivery, as the baby gets closer to being delivered, those contractions increase in frequency and intensity. And it becomes immensely painful for the woman. The woman here is the earth, and it will become immensely painful in the earth before the birth of the kingdom of God into the earth. That pain is not pleasant. That pain almost looks like God's not in control anymore, but he is. Jesus is the one who opens the seven seals. What's the first seal? The first seal seal is the rider on, on the white horse. That's Antichrist. Jesus is the one that breaks the seal to release the Antichrist. He must be the one who restrains. So Jesus is in complete control of this thing. He is sovereign over every aspect of the birth pains and the move toward delivery of the kingdom of God. And that delivery, the actual delivery, the crowning of the head, if you will, of the kingdom of God really begins in earnest with the abomination of desolation. The Antichrist goes into the temple of God. There is no temple right now. We're watching and waiting to see that thing uh, built or placed on the temple mount or wherever they're going to put it. And whoever the Antichrist is, I believe he will be a Jew. My personal belief will go into the city and into the temple and desecrate it. Jesus says, when you see that, run to the mountains. He says, if Jesus is going to say, be on guard, I've told you all these things beforehand, that he's not going to come before these things happen and deliver us from persecution. That's just, that's just false doctrine, people. 28, from the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as this branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. Hey, watch the signs of the times. He says, you look at the sky, you, you know it's going to rain. Now look at the fig tree. You know when it's going to bud. You, you know these things. Why don't you know the signs of the times? So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he, the Son of Man, is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass until all these things take place. The generation who sees the birth pains will not pass until they see the Antichrist rise. That's what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2. Don't make him contradict himself by saying, well, the church will escape before the Antichrist rises. That's the Holy Spirit's the one who's restraining, so the Holy Spirit has to go up into heaven with the church so the Antichrist can rise and do his wickedness. When Paul just said in the very same paracope, no, that's not true. By the way, those who teach that the Holy Spirit is he who restrains and goes up with the church in the rapture so the Antichrist can rise also say there will be people in their, their so-called great tribulation who will be saved. Let me ask you, how are people saved without the Holy Spirit? You don't even have a, have a, have a biblical soteriology. It's ridiculous that you think people can be saved in what you call the great tribulation with the Holy Spirit. You've taught the Holy Spirit has gone back to heaven. The Holy Spirit is the agent of salvation. It's time to wake up. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass until these things take place. The generation that sees the birth pains will be the generation in which the Antichrist rises and the generation that sees Jesus come back. Truly, I say to you, these generation will not pass. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning the day and that hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Now, we don't know the day nor the hour. The Feast of Trumpets, when the blast sounded, which will probably be the the, the, the harvest in which Jesus returns. The Jews didn't know the day nor the hour when to blow the trumpets. It could be uh, this day or the next, okay? But you had to watch the moon to know when to blow the trumpet. You don't know the day nor the hour. But Jesus over and over says, you should know the seasons. You should, should know the signs of the times. So in the midst of persecution, the church looks up and says, he could come at any moment. No one knows, not even the angels of heaven. Be on guard. There he is again. Be on guard. Why would he warn us of being on guard? For the Antichrist, for the abomination of desolation, watching the signs of the times, 
knowing if you're seeing potentially the beginning of birth pains. The church will have to endure to the end, people. you got to wake up. Keep awake. Be on guard. Keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his own work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. There it is again. Therefore, stay awake. There it is again. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning. (laughs) Stay awake, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Don't go to spirit, don't spiritually don't go to sleep. Don't do that. It's dangerous. It's the most dangerous thing that can happen to a believer or a so-called believer going to sleep. Persecution is not dangerous to your soul. Going to sleep is dangerous to your soul. I heard an Iranian woman this week. Her husband was able to move the family to the United States. They were born-again Christians living in Iran where probably the greatest persecution in in the world is happening today, and they were able to move to the United States and escape this persecution. And after living in the United States for several years, she looked at her husband and said, please take me back to Iran. There is a spiritual satanic lullaby in this country, and it it puts Christians to sleep. Take me back. I, I, I don't want to fall asleep like American Christians are. Her point is that spiritual sleepiness, the point of Jesus, the point of Paul, is that spiritual sleepiness is more dangerous than outright persecution. I'm going to potentially, possibly, if led by the Spirit, send you a video this week about the Iranian church, and I want you to watch it. It's two hours. Moving to a close. Paul, to Timothy, gives us some markers about the last days. He says, understand this, that in the last days there will be times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, unappeasable. Sounds like a lot of church people. Slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving, treacherous, reckless, swollen with with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. That's That's, he says... In the last days, there'll be times of difficulty. The difficulty will be caused by these these self-centered people, these sin-loving people. Paul's point is not that people have been good up until this point. Paul's point is that people have used to hide their sin. People used to be ashamed of their sin up until this point in the last days. And now, in the last days, they celebrate their sin openly. Evil has been deemed good, and good has been deemed evil. Light has been called dark, and darkness is being called light. The world has been given over to the throes, the throes of open perversion, self-love, hatred of righteousness, false religion that has no effect on the heart of man. They're hedonists, they're materialists, they're blasphemers, they're devilish, they're even satanic. Just look at Netflix or Hulu or, or YouTube. Satanism is all over the screen. Hollywood loves Lucifer. The world is in the throes with this serpent of the garden. These things are revealed to us, though, that we've examined today not to make you panic. Not so you would panic and arm up and then bug out. They're given to the church by our Master, Lord, and Savior and coming warrior so that we would wake up, wake up from our slumber, wake up from our sleep, Jesus said, you be cold, you be hot. If you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. These warnings are given to us, these signs, these these markers are given to us so that we would remain steadfast in our faith and persevere to the end. Stay awake has been the message for 2,000 years. It's not a new message. It's not like, oh, the end of the world is here. Let's wake up. No, we were told to wake up 2,000 years ago. All right, We've been being told by the apostles and Jesus to stay awake for 2,000 years. So watch the sky. That means study the scriptures and walk in the spirit, and you won't be surprised by the birth pains, by the contractions. And especially you won't be surprised when the kingdom of God descends upon the earth to crash into every nation. Watch the sky. Look at that fig tree. Is it budding? Is it about to shoot forth its leaves? Is it about to bear fruit? 
Is the fruit about to drop to the ground? Don't be taken off guard by the thief that is coming in the night at the midnight cry. Don't be taken off guard. 2020, if it's anything, it's a wake-up call. The alarm is sounding. It should be ringing in your ears for you sleepy Christians, you sleepy Western church. you got to wake up. We are carnal, we're ignorant, we're half-hearted, we're comfortable. We barely even know the Jesus we proclaim. We are more informed by Hollywood and the mainstream media than they are the Word of God. Let me just hold that up. We're more informed by Hollywood and the mainstream media than we are this Word. And that's the truth. Our men are like boys in the faith. Our, with feminism is more prominent than that meek and quiet spirit which God adores in women in our churches. Our children are worldly, and they fall away the first chance they get to leave the house and leave the church and the body of Christ. Our cravings are more for this 1950s civil religion of Mayberry than they are for the all-consuming, nation-crushing kingdom of God. Our Christ is a weak-eyed beggar of men instead of a conquering Lord who smashes the knees of those who will not bow before him with the rod of iron. He's, he's He's less the warrior in the clouds covered in the blood of God's enemies, and he's more that meek and mild crucified Savior of the Renaissance paintings. Now, he's meek and mild, and he's loving, and he's compassionate, and he weeps for his children. But he doesn't beg anybody to come into the kingdom. And when he comes back, he's coming dressed in the robes of war with a tattoo on his thigh, (laughs) riding the white horse of war, carrying the, the, the iron rod of war, sword coming out of his mouth, covered in the blood of his enemies, treading out the winepress of God's wrath. You don't know Jesus unless you know him as both the meek and mild lamb and the conquering lion of Judah. Our churches seem to be forts with high walls instead of marching armies. And our weak faith rarely sees any healings, any miracles, or any radical conversions. If 2020 is not a wake-up call to the Western church and the global birth pains that I believe we're seeing and most Christians who are in the know of the Word of God, you know, the only people crying peace and safety are the Joel Osteens of the world. Those who have their nose in the Word of God and their feet shod with the preparation of the gospel and their helmet, uh, their, their head covered in the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit in their hand, the buckler of truth around their waist, those people are all saying, church, wake up. If we continue hoping that the kingdom of man will be kind to us, will continue to be kind of us so we can keep our high level, uh, high standard of living in this earth, our fall is going to be great. Dear God, wake up the church. Wake us up. Lord, help us to be that marching army in these days. Lord, if we're wrong about the birth pains, we should still wake up. We've been told to wake up for 2,000 years and to stay awake. But Lord, I pray that the sleepy church of the Western world would be rattled awake so that we are ready for what is coming, so that we can stand and be an ensign, a light to the world, that our Christ is conquered and he conquered through a cross. And our defeat is only supposed. It's actually our victory. Help us to die before we die. That's what you offer. A death before death. A death on the cross with you so that this life is not held precious. Help us not to hold our lives precious, but to march into the arms of Christ no matter what it costs us and to see the kingdom come. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, come quickly. Maranatha. Maranatha. What a word. Lord Jesus, come. In Jesus' name we pray to our Father.